I appreciate all of you sticking around to hear the last speech. The following is really a collection of the thoughts that have brewed over the last six years of my time from entering here to now graduating. In nature, everything participates in a circle. Predators eat other animals that ate plants, and when they die, they regenerate the same plants that their prey was eating. The water, seasons, and trees all operate on cycles. It's apparent that everything on this planet is connected. But the human species? We've somehow fallen under a spell in amazement with our own technology that we've been able to fall into a delusion that nature and our bodies are somehow separate entities within this circle. But in truth, people cannot exist without nature. And while Mother Earth may be scarred by us, and sometimes even healed by our presence, she is always enveloping us. But our belief that we somehow have perfect control over science is our greatest arrogance. Added to the belief that we are somehow independent of everything else, that the environment is over there in Hopkins Forest, we've bought into this arrogant misconception that we can actually take control of nature and that evolution has culminated in the human species as if our species was not the product of millions of years of adaptation and will not go on changing for millions and millions of years to follow us. We as a species have lost touch with the Earth. Modern Americans, more so than any other people on this planet, live in artificially constructed, unsustainable communities. No longer do we need to worry about our immediate surroundings since most of our needs are met by networks of trade that just bring everything right to our doorstep. But think about it for just one second. Kiwis, three for a dollar, in the Berkshires, in the middle of winter, is not natural. We've somehow created this set of products for consumption that would not have been available 100 years ago without critically questioning its content. BBC News reported just last month that Dutch scientists have used stem cells to create strips of muscle tissue with the aim of producing the first lab-grown hamburger by the end of the year. Well, most food scientists believe that the current methods of food production are unsustainable. And so this future is the one that they're thinking is going to be economically viable. We as a people then have just settled into the ease and availability peddled to us by massive global food networks. And in doing so, we've given up on real variety. Because when the lab meat comes, it's not going to taste that different. The grocery stores across this country may have different names, but they all have a standardized set of products available by less than 10 companies that provide over 90% of the food that are in the grocery stores in this country. And by relying on this corporate food system, we have opted for convenient consumption regardless of the cost of the health to the planet. We have embraced a culture of complicity. Americans today like to live in these little compact boxes. We wake up every morning in our own little house box, pop tarts out of a box, into another box, then we get into our car boxes, then we sit grudgingly in traffic with all the other people in boxes, then most of our population spends its day in some sort of box, and then, at the end of the day, it goes home in its box, picks up fried chicken, hamburgers, taco, pizza, or fish in a box, and then when they get there, they flip on the television or the computer, and then they zone out until the next day begins. Does this sound like anybody you know? The, the food lifestyle of this country is literally killing it. Our American culture of 24-hour availability and consistency 
has created appallingly low standards with regards to our food. And we as a country can't tolerate this. Even food that's labeled as organic at the grocery store only guarantees its origin, not necessarily its treatment upon shipment or arrival to the store. Now, I, I know tonight that I'm speaking to a pretty educated crowd. So I need you to raise your hands if any of the following titles sound familiar. Food Inc. I got a few. Fast Food Nation. Supersize Me. Omnivore's Dilemma. The links that these works illuminate that we all know between our diet, lifestyle, and causes of death are scary to me. Because in 1900, cancer killed only 4% and heart disease only 9% of our country annually. But today, these diseases are the number one and number two killers in our nation, causing 23 and 26% of all deaths in the United States annually. The next eight common most causes of death combined do not take the total of lives taken by these diseases. Well, what's the connection here? Over the course of the 20th century, the number of meals eaten at home as opposed to out, dropped from 9 out of 10 to 1 out of 2, or a 50-50 split. Now granted, not all Americans eat out this much, but given the number of fast food chain locations already in existence, and the number of new ones being built each year, it is clear that the corporate takeover of food production and distribution has become embedded in our culture. According to Fast Food Nation, one out of every four American adults eats some sort of fast food each day. And it's only modern industrial farming practices that are able to keep up with this level of consumption. But all the people that have seen those films or read those books know that the truth is, cows are meant to eat grass from a field, <laughs> not genetically modified corn from trows. And chickens and pigs live happier lives when they're free outside instead of cramped inside stalls covered in their own feces, pumped full of antibiotics that facilitate these unsanitary farming practices. And vegetables are not meant to be sprayed with poisons to the human body just so that they can be shipped thousands of miles across the country. But not only does food taste better when it's raised naturally, people feel better about the process of making the food. And I have to admit that working on a certified humane farm last summer gave me a radical new appreciation for food. After taking care of a newborn calf, I could no longer deny the former sentience of a sirloin steak. And this is why last semester I petitioned dining services to just let me off the meal plan so I could serve my own needs. But since I was living on campus, I was unable to be on anything lower than five meals a week. But I am fortunate enough to go to a place like Williams, where they were able to arrange to buy me four meals a week from Cricket Creek Farm here in town, and one meal a week from Misty Knoll in Vermont, most definitely meeting their commitment to buying local fresh food whenever possible. Conveniently, buying food that meets this criteria is usually certified humane as well. These operations strive to provide animals with the highest quality possible environment during their life which leads to a positive relationship, not only between the animals and the workers, but the land. Unfortunately, the people who work in corporate farming environments are forced to deny the essence of an animal's spirit, the same kind of master-slave relationship that illegal workers in this country are subjected to. The 20 million illegal immigrants, many of whom participate in the large agribusiness economy, make up the new slave class in our so-called democratic society, since they can be put into conditions that earn them less than the minimum wage and they have virtually no real legal protection. These underpaid laborers help make possible the fact that there's no other place on the planet with cheaper food than the United States of America. Today, Americans spend a mere 5.5% of their disposable income on food consumed at home. But the residents of Mexico spend 24.1%. 
which is about what Americans spent during the Great Depression, and yet we import 34% of our fruit and vegetables from Mexico. What is fair trade if we never expect that the people who we trade with are going to achieve the same standard of living as us? We live in an era of free trade colonialism, where other nations are effectively forced because of our military and economic power to export food and labor to sell to American consumers who waste 33 million tons of those food purchases each year to the tune of $43 billion each year while someone in the world dies of hunger every 3.5 seconds. But for residents of Berkshire County, avoiding the industrial food system is incredibly easy. All you have to do is simply don't eat meat, vegetables, or animal products from any source that you can't or wouldn't want to visit. Very few places in the United States have a true food culture that they can call their own. But here in the Berkshires, we have options. Buying into community-supported agriculture, better known as a CSA, may seem more expensive because you have to pay all the money up front. But I promise you, if you add up all the grocery store visits and all the eating out, paying the farmers will be cheaper. But I would like you to ask yourself one very simple question. Who would you rather pay, the farmer or the doctor? You can make the choice to find out where your food is from because you can refuse to be a passive consumer of food any longer. Because if money is time, then how we spend our money is an extension of not only ourselves, but our morals. And like it or not, you all in this room right now actively shape the world around you with the food purchases that you make. And businesses that don't sell products don't last for very long. And the ones that meet our demands will continue to survive and thrive and grow. But the only way to know that something is what it claims to be is to go directly to the source. Or better yet, grow it yourself. <laughs> a good place to start is with a compost pile. And I know that this very church hosted a workshop at the beginning of February to teach people how to build a proper compost pile. Instead of taking all your scraps down to the local dump, turn them back into valuable dirt. Then you can plant something in your yard using this compost. The raised bed demo garden right outside this building facing Route 2 is an active example. Go check out the Williams College Sustainable Growers down in Dodd if you want a better example. And keep walking down to the elementary school if you want to see more. Anyone who's eaten one will tell you that nothing beats a homegrown tomato. And if you add a little bit of fresh basil for pasta sauce, it's the best. <laughs> if you happen to be able to store a little extra in cans for the winter, you can cut your food costs too. But if you happen to have a little bit of pasture or woods and you like to eat meat, just consider getting a few animals or keeping a hive of bees. It really doesn't take that much effort to raise a pig or a cow or a few chickens or ducks, at least not more than it does to raise your six dogs and eight cats. <laughs> and then you get to taste the difference between something from the store and something from your yard. But look, I'm not telling everyone they need to go out and quit their day jobs and become farmers. <laughs> There'd be nothing wrong with that. I mean, it, it, it's what I'm doing after I graduate from this place. But what I am saying is that we all need to find ways to become more engaged and aware of the processes by which food gets to our table. And if everybody just did a little 
more to participate in the production of their own food, it wouldn't only help improve the health of our bodies, but our environment around our bodies and the world community. A few chores each day is really all it takes to keep a limited number of livestock or plants. And can you imagine if you took all the time that you invested in watching TV or going to the gym and you put it into food production, what might happen? You might actually talk to your neighbors on top of getting your exercise in because farming is hard work. But it doesn't have to all be hard. Some evening, you could just take your kids to see the cows being milked and meet and talk to the farmer who's doing it. Or take a walk in Hopkins Forest and try foraging for mushrooms. Here's a hint. Check near apple orchards in the spring, a few days after the rain, and your chances of finding a gourmet's meal worth of morel mushrooms is very, very high. All you need is a half hour. Try challenging your neighbors to bringing a homegrown or locally foraged item to a potluck at the end of this summer. You will be amazed at what people can bring to the table when you ask them to. The possibilities are endless for engaging oneself in the surrounding food environment. And I would say that you got to start small. Don't be afraid to take on the big projects. You might actually find you enjoy being outside because actively shaping and creating the world around you is the most rewarding experience that I have found. We do not have to live inside a box. We do not have to live the way that the commercials tell us to and we are not imprisoned by our corporate culture. When we decide to stop building bombs and start building communities, then we will have a much better place to live in. Because humanity lived in harmony with nature for thousands and thousands of years, and we can still do it today.